Hello, my name's Lloyd Webb, and today I'd like to share with you a couple of slides just to talk about the internet security threat landscape and some potential countermeasures. So as part of this agenda, what I'd like to do is just go back in time and just look at kind of where we've come from and just take a look back in time to see what types of attacks we were experiencing, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And then what we'll do is take a look at some of the more recent attacks that we've experienced. And then to finish up, what I'd like to do is just really share some ideas in and around architectures that we can utilize to reduce some of this risk. Before we do that, I'd like to share with you a quote from a person called Dan Gear. Dan Gear is the CISO for an organization called Incutel. Now he's a scientist, a security scientist, and effectively what he's saying here in one of his uh, fantastic speeches, he's basically talking about how our attack surface is increasing exponentially and really our defenses not, are not keeping up to date with the, uh, with the scale of the attack surface. You know, if you just look at where we're going in terms of the Internet of Things and the industrial Internet of Things, you can just imagine just how many um, devices are going to be online in the next 10, 20 years. Billions and billions of new devices with IP addresses that all have an attack surface. So, let's talk a little bit about where we've come from. And then here, just another quote from uh, an NSA director. Attacks always get better and they never get worse, which is absolutely true when we come to look at this next slide. So as you can see here, we've got uh, across the y-axis, we've got something called sophistication. Across the x-axis, we've got some uh, some years. So what we're going to do is map. Um, initially, uh, we're going to map kind of just where the internet came from. And it came from um, a project that was funded by the U.S. Def Department of Defense back in the 60s. ARPANET was really the foundation of the modern day internet and it was developed by the University of Stanford and then for about four or so years later the UK actually got connected up to ARPANET and, and at that point in time it really was still just a university network um, just for research really wasn't too many hosts and people connected up to that network then of course you know as a consumer of you know kind of the early internet like technologies we had things like bulletin boards that we used to connect to you know dialing up with modems to bulletin boards then of course you know over time we got access to things like usenet which really were the foundation and the beginnings of what were kind of internet forums where you could share ideas and talk to uh, like-minded individuals but it wasn't really until 1990 that the internet really exploded uh, with the invention of HTML, when Sir Tim Berners-Lee uh, invented HTML, it really gave us a way of easily uh, viewing information uh, across various different servers uh, using the HTML markup language. And that's really where the modern day kind of browser was, was really kind of invented to display these pages. So back then in 1990, the early 90s, we had something like circa 16 million users online at that time. But then, of course, you know, when we start to look at you know, the various different types of attacks that we experienced uh, back in the 80s and 90s, the first attack being the PC brain virus. This was the first compatible PC compatible virus that was uh, experienced by people distributed on a five and a quarter inch floppy disk all the way up to the modern day attacks. That, and some of them we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides. Specifically, we're going to talk about the Dooku 2 attack that uh, Kaspersky experienced earlier this year so where where have we come from today you know where are we in terms of 2015 now you know a number of different uh, organizations on this slide and by no means it's a, uh, it's a complete list but obviously we will have all have read about the office of personnel management ashley madison the hacking team the anthem attack and obviously more recently the talk talk attack but some of these organizations really were you know severely breached the Office of Personnel Management, something like 21 million social security numbers and up to 1 million fingerprints of federal workers for the US government. You know, very confidential information that was stolen from OPM. And then just going down to Talk Talk, you know, a number of different, you know, young uh, attackers that have, uh, that have breached the Talk Talk infrastructure. 
you know, even people like the hacking team, the hacking team kind of fall into this gray area. They're actually a commercial organization that develop malware for organizations and nation states. So an Italian based organization that were breached and they had something like 400 terabytes worth of information that were published online. And, uh, you know, it certainly sounded like a, a vigilante that uh, decided to, uh, to breach the hacking team. In fact, it was uh, rumored that it was the same person that actually hacked the Gamma German company uh, group recently uh, in the last year or two. Again, a very similar organization in terms of developing malware that they sell to nation states and to organizations. So obviously, you know, very kind of interesting year in terms of where we are up until now. But today I'd like to just focus in on a couple of attacks. We're gonna talk about the APT attack on Kaspersky Labs, a really very sophisticated attack indeed. The reason it was so sophisticated was really because of how it leveraged multiple zero day attacks. And a zero day really is, uh, it's an exploit that has never been seen before. And it's taken advantage of a vulnerability that nobody knows about. And you know, to leverage an, an exploit like that, one that people have never seen before, it costs a lot of money. So that you know, so it really was very sophisticated in terms of its uh, of its attack um, um, method methodology, and you know, leveraged multiple zero days as well. Now, the the way that we believe Kaspersky were infected was via um, a spearfish to an employee in Asia Pac. Now, what was interesting was that actually at the same time. The UN Security Council apparently had uh, felt the same attack from the same piece of malware. And of course, at the time, the UN Security Council were holding talks to talk about the Iranian nuclear enrichment program. And there was only one country that wasn't invited to those talks. And so I'm sure we can guess who that might be, especially as it had strong um, code similarities to, uh, to Stuxnet. So in terms of why it was so sophisticated, well, it was memory resident. It really just stayed in memory. It never was written to disk permanently. And the way it was, dis it was discovered was one of the Kaspersky engineers was developing a new piece of software uh, to, to identify attacks. And actually he kept finding this anomaly in memory, he kept finding this strange thing on his own machine when he was testing out his new, his new prototype. And he got so suspicious, he got to a point where he, just, he asked a colleague to actually test the software as well. So just, you know, just run this software for me just to see if you're still getting the same anomaly. And sure enough, his colleague had exactly the same problem. Um, something was discovered in memory, um, the same as, uh, as the, the original person that originally discovered the, the, uh, the piece of malware in memory. So from that point forward, obviously they realized they were, they were breached. Now the way they had to clean this piece of malware up was they had to simultaneously reboot all of their machines in the estate because it because as soon as um, you rebooted the machine, the, the malware was removed. But of course, if you just rebooted a few machines and left a few other machines online, those machines that were left online would reinfect each other. So they had to simultaneously reboot their whole network to get rid of this malware because it was purely memory resident. And then just something which is more kind of consumer based. I wanted to quickly talk about the Drydex banking Trojan because it actually it looked like it was going to be a, a bit of good news. The reason it was going to be a, a little bit of good news was that um, it was actually taken offline back in October. Now it turns out I read in the last couple of days that actually it seems that somebody has resurrected the, uh, the command and control network. But for a little while, you know, we had an opportunity to get cleaned up those people that were infected because actually, you know, the original people that set up this uh, this um, this network of, uh, of uh, command and control infrastructure for the Drydex Trojan, they were arrested. So a Russian national and a Moldovan man were arrested uh, back in October. Now, of course, you know, the source is very likely Eastern European due to the people that were um, arrested, but really this was a Trojan that was distributed via spam messages and uh, within the UK, it's estimated that up to 20 million pounds worth of, of uh, money was actually stolen from, uh, from UK users. Now, you know, this is your typical information grabbing piece of malware. It's really there to steal whatever information you're seeing on your screen and to steal whatever information you're typing into your keyboard. As if you were sat right in front of your keyboard, 
It's there to steal and monitor your activity. And once it's monitored your activity and it's exfiltrated that data back up to the command and control infrastructure, then the attacker has you know usernames, passwords, everything he needs to uh, to try and steal information, steal money from you. Now it was distributed like a lot of malware was distributed, distributed via um, via a spearfish, or rather more likely a spam attack. So as you can see here on the left hand side, we can see here a users received a Word document, and of course, you know, as you open that Word document. Um, you get this warning to say that there's a an embedded macro. And of course, there's a little message at the top of that Word document to say, well, you didn't enable macros. Content can't be visible. Of course, most people, you know, because they're curious individuals, will enable that content. And from that point forward, that macro, that VB script, will go and download that piece of malware, that Drydex piece of malware, and that person is then infected. So what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about some architectures, some technical architectures that we can do to help reduce this risk. Now, I think this quote here from Carl von Clausewitz uh, is really quite interesting because it really kind of marries up with a point that I'm going to make next, which is, you know, if you entrench yourself behind strong fortifications, you compel the enemy to seek a solution elsewhere. And literally, that's where we've... That's where we still are today in terms of internet architecture. And really it all started with this concept of getting connected up to the internet, initially via routers. You know, back in the early 90s, we got connected up to the internet via a router, you know, and life was good, we were connected to the internet, we weren't concerned about security. You know, it wasn't really at the forefront of our minds when we were connected to the internet in the early 90s. But shortly, shortly after we got connected up to the internet via routers, we decided that actually it might be a good idea to implement firewalls. And still back in the mid 90s, you know, information security was really straightforward. There wasn't too many high profile attacks. And some of those attacks really weren't, they really weren't that malicious. It was just really about kind of youngsters, you know, that were testing out their newfound skills. Generally they were teenage boys you know, sat in their bedrooms, connecting up to the internet and learning about hacking and defacing websites. It really wasn't a huge amount of um, people that were really trying to steal information from one, one another. Of course, life today in 2015 is, is vastly different. You know, with 3 billion internet users, we have lots of different types of attacker that are coming after our, our information. We've got, you know, still got your youngsters that are still testing out their hacking skills. You know, for example, you know, a Northern Irish boy was uh, was arrested uh, on suspicion of having some involvement in the Talk Talk attack recently. But you've got various different types of groups that are after uh, making money or stealing secrets or making a point. You know, purely just making up you know, a political point uh, with regards to utilizing you know, their skills and their internet security skills and hacking skills on the internet. And of course, what organizations are starting to do now is they start to model um, the threats based on based on the types of information that they're trying to protect. So, for example, you know, if you're um, if you have lots of personal information about your customers, um, then potentially, you know, that could be worth money on the black market to organize crime gang gangs. If you're developing, you know, new technologies and you have lots of industrial secrets that you're trying to protect, then possibly a nation state might want to come after those industrial secrets. So based on the types of organization that you are and the information that you're keeping, you know, that data is valuable to different types of people. So threat modeling is something that's quite popular at the moment. So before we kind of dive into some controls, and I'm going to kind of cover and cover the controls in kind of these four main buckets, if you like, I just wanted to kind of highlight, you know, that I don't have, you know, the answer to all of our problems. There is no silver bullet, as it's been said many, many times. There is no silver bullet, but these are just some some things that I've been looking at over the past few months, and some, you know, some general themes that I've come across when I've been you know, reading up on some of these attacks. So what can we do when we want to detect the previously unknown? So for example, you know, the attack on Kaspersky, it leveraged an unknown threat vector, you know, an unknown zero day, never been seen before. What can we do to really start detecting some of that, you know, previously unseen um, attack uh, vectors before? 
So of course, you know, behavioral detonation of suspicion, suspicious files and objects have become quite popular. So sandboxing technology has become quite popular over the last two or three years. And that really can give you a view. It can emulate the interaction with suspicious files and web sessions. You know, it can pretend to be a user and give you a view as to, as to whether, you know, those, uh, those sessions and objects are malicious or not. Then of course you've got exploit, anti-exploit features, and in fact Microsoft give away a toolkit to be able to uh, help you prevent anti, uh, to prevent exploits rather. Um, and um, you know if you can prevent the exploit, you can really prevent the whole malware lifecycle because really the exploit is that initial foothold that an attacker is trying to get uh, within your organization. If an exploit is successful, then the main, the next part of the malware lifecycle is really the dropper, and the dropper is the main piece of malware. So that the exploit, if you like, injects a small piece of code into the application or operating system to really retrieve uh, from the internet you know, a much larger piece of software. So anti-exploit features are very powerful. There are a plethora of uh, new next generation endpoint technologies out there and they all come in with a slightly different angle, you know, whether it's a DLP angle, whether it's a whitelisting angle. You know, there's lots of different companies out there these days that can help you with some next gen endpoint technology. You've also got web application firewalling. You know, if you look at the talk talk attack, it was a SQL injection attack. You know, by having a whitelist um, profile and rule base for web applications, you can basically police what's good and what's bad. And then of course, host based intrusion prevention, you know, something that Tripwire is very popular in terms of supplying our uh, customers with being able to detect unauthorized changes and look for you know system integrity and uh, being able to monitor in real time what's going on on those systems and then here just a photograph of you know an x-men character this x-men character as we know can kind of morph into different uh, faces and people and really that's just to kind of illustrate that you know there are so many new malware samples these days virus total at one point had one million new malware samples per day which is just a huge thing to keep up to date with and then of course you've got you know what technologies that can help you detect something that's quite new it might be an hour old it might be a few days old but utilizing threat intelligence can really give you an idea of the types of attacks that are taking place in other like-minded organizations to yourself you know other if you're a retail organization what the retail attacks are um, other companies saying and being able to share that kind of community-based threat intelligence can be very very powerful and then we've got things like you know network forensics data being able to not only kind of SSL decrypt information on the wire because attackers are getting more sophisticated in fact I was reading recently that actually an attacker built an SSL command and control network that they were renting out to other attackers but also just utilizing yes you know utilizing things like IPS utilizing like network forensics appliances to be able to detect and monitor what's going on on the network but something that's really very important and still a lot not too many organizations that are doing a fantastic job at this which is just you know patch management you know fixing the vulnerabilities that you have in your estate and you know obviously closing off those gaps that those attackers can go after you know it's the low hanging fruit for an attacker you know an old vulnerability that's still exposed on your infrastructure and then kind of auditing where your users are coming from but you know not only auditing but obviously strong authentication but auditing users and, and the locations where they're logging in from there's been a you know a few attacks where you know an attacker has managed to get a foothold via remote access via vpn and it turns out that obviously you know their geography doesn't really match where they where, you know where that user comes from and then of course just making best use of the logging tools that you have already purchased but even just things like monitoring your DNS logs, DNS can give you a wealth of information in terms of, you know, new malware that's uh, that's doing uh, DNS lookups for command and control infrastructure. And then something that really kind of caught my eye recently is just being able to segment your networks, and not only that, but just understand what's on your network. Now, there's this attack that's very very popular for attackers, you know. You know, nine times out of ten, probably ten times out of ten, an attacker will try and get a foothold in an organization and they're ultimately just trying to get, you know, domain admin privileges. And they can do that very, very quickly. Within 48 hours, most attackers can get a domain admin privilege. 
And the reason they do this is because of the way that Windows networks work. But you can limit some of this exposure. You can limit this exposure by correct network segmentation. And the reason you need that is because as soon as anyone logs into a workstation, if you like their password is stored in memory, it's stored away and it's you know not too easy to get a hold of, or hold of a copy, but with the right tool and with local admin privileges, you know a user can retrieve and that other user's password from memory if they've logged into their machine. So for example, if you've got a domain admin and they're logging into your local workstation, and you as a user of your local workstation, you've got local admin access to your local workstation. If you open up a piece of malware and that piece of malware infects your machine and that piece of malware and it basically effectively impersonates your privileges as local admin, that local admin user can then read the domain admin password because the domain administrator had logged into your machine and their credential was still stored in memory. And it's called a pass the hash technique. It's a very popular technique. And in fact, it was utilized in uh, the loop pay attack recently, uh, Target, and of course, uh, there was a casino that FireEye had identified had been uh, breached uh, because it had a very flat open network that wasn't properly segmented. And there's lots of material you can get on this to read about. And then just in terms of kind of processes, you know, ISO 27001 can be a very good benchmark for you to start to implement security best practice. And it can actually give you um, quite a competitive advantage because it really shows that your organization is really thinking carefully about the, the security and the management of risk. So I absolutely recommend, you know, as an organization to look into becoming ISO 27001 compliant. And certainly Tripwire can help you measure your, your infrastructure uh, against that compliance standard. Another kind of, if you like, voluntary compliance standard is the CIS security configuration benchmarks. What these are, are best practice on how to secure your server and desktop estate. And again, Tripwire has a number of different policies that can help you measure how compliant you are against these standards. So instead of reading a, a 30 page PDF and, and, uh, and measuring yourself against the PDF, you can actually download a policy that will do it for you automatically within seconds using Tripwire. And then, of course, you've got the SANS top 20 critical security controls. If you've not read these, I highly recommend there's about a 30 page PDF that you can read that really is just uh, it's just a, a who's who in terms of you know, best practice and recommendations you know, written by some of the most um, the most switched on security experts out there in the market. And, you know, the top four are particularly relevant to Tripwire. We can help you address the top four of the SANS top 20 critical security controls. So understanding what's on the network from a hardware and software perspective, being able to measure the configuration um, of your uh, infrastructure and make sure it's uh, it's got as much integrity as possible. And also just being able to understand what vulnerabilities you have in the network and how to remediate those vulnerabilities. And then just really one slide on, you know, a couple of products that can help you from Tripwire. You've got Tripwire Enterprise that can really monitor for good and bad changes, give you that overall view in terms of system integrity. It can do it in real time as well. So just a very quick high level in terms of what Tripwire Enterprise can achieve. And then of course IP360 in terms of vulnerability assessment and being able to understand not only what's on the network in terms of the you know hardware and software versions, but also whether you're vulnerable to anything. So and these products can work in conjunction to uh, complement each other. So the final slide I have for you today is just really just a few key takeaways. First one being, you know, start to look at threat modeling, start to understand what it is you've got to protect and what type of attacker might come after that information. And then kind of overlaying kind of threat intelligence, you know, understanding uh, really um, what types of attacks are affecting other organizations similar to yourselves. Start to overlay and look for those threats within your own network. Bolster your detection and response capabilities. So, you know, look at, you know, how can you detect brand new attacks? If really you've got um, something that, you know, um, a, uh, an advanced attacker might come after, then really you need to be looking at you know, bolstering those uh, that zero day detection capability. But also just like looking at the fundamentals, you know, there's many reports this year, you know, the, uh, 
the HP report this year, the data, data breach report from uh, Verizon this year, you know, really showed that you know a lot of organisations are not following good fundamentals and best practice. So there's lots of things that we can do that I've highlighted in this presentation to really help us reduce that attack surface, and also just you know get to know your networks and segment them accordingly. Um, as we saw, that patch the hash technique is very powerful for an attacker, but with correct network segmentation and knowing what's on the network, it can really benefit you. And then just to finish up, you know, in terms of some useful resources, um, just a couple of uh, PDFs here that might be useful for you, but there's a ton of information on this website that you can go and take a look at. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time, and I uh, hope you enjoy, enjoyed this.